August 1947. A nation is about to be born. Its founding father, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, lands at the new capital, Karachi. Thousands of jubilant Muslims shout, Pakistan, Zindabad. Long live Pakistan. I think they were very excited at the idea of getting Pakistan. Economically, they felt they were going to be much better. Secondly, I think they felt that, you know, we would be out of the domination of the Hindus. As a young man, I was all for my homeland. And I was ready to die and work hard in order to achieve the goal that was set out by Mr. Jinnah. In the West, Jinnah is little known, unlike his famous contemporary, Mahatma Gandhi. Yet even more than Gandhi, Jinnah shaped the turbulent events which unfolded 50 years ago. Jinnah has been popularly portrayed as the man behind partition, responsible for bloodily tearing the Indian subcontinent apart, most notoriously in the feature film, Gandhi. How do you propose to separate? Where there is a Muslim majority, that will be Pakistan. The rest is your India. I get Jinnah. The Muslims are in a majority on two different sides of the country. Let us worry about Pakistan. You worry about India. But is this view of Jinnah and his role in partition correct? Tonight we present compelling evidence that until the end he didn't want partition and that he never foresaw the full price of Pakistan. The one thing I know, and I, I was very much aware of, and he discussed it, he never really wanted to, uh, to break away. The frontier between India and Pakistan. Here, every evening, the border police on each side lower their national flag. But behind the colour lies hostility. The two nations have gone to war three times in five decades. Almost all Pakistanis are Muslim. Their nation is now an Islamic state. Across the border, most Indians are Hindu. The hope many once had for a unified India of all religions has now passed into history. The final rites were performed 50 years ago this month. On August the 13th, 1947, the last Viceroy of India, Lord Louis Mountbatten, swept into Karachi for a celebratory banquet. It was hosted by Muhammad Ali Jinnah. I got this amazing sense of his power, of the, of the, of the potency of the man. Here is Pakistan's King Emperor, Archbishop of Canterbury, Prime Minister, Speaker, all rolled into one formidable Kadiyazam. Kadiyazam, meaning great leader, was the title Jinnah's followers had given him. Yet at this moment of his greatest triumph, he seems strangely aloof. I was responsible for the bodyguard. Mountbatten went through the process of introducing me. And the Khadi Adam listened to him for a minute or so, uh, and then retired. So I don't think uh, beyond the call of duty, he enjoyed the, the pomp and uh, ceremony excessively, but he played his part, I think. There was no sense of exhilaration or, uh, or of excitement. He was, he was, he was reflective, reserved, quiet, still. Jinnah already knew from the huge number of refugees pouring into Karachi that Pakistan was being born at a price. But that night no one foresaw the full scale of the bloodshed to come. The next morning, Jinnah and his sister, Fatima, drove from government house to the new parliament for the transfer of power. The Mountbatten's followed, amid a final display of British pomp. Jinnah assured Mountbatten of Pakistan's goodwill towards Britain. Your Excellency, I thank 
His Majesty, the King, on behalf of the Pakistan, the President Assembly, and myself, for his vicious message. Yes, we are parting as friends. And I sincerely hope that we shall remain friends. Britain's departure brought glee. Partition would bring horror. In British India, Muslims had lived as majorities in the northwest and northeast. These areas formed the basis for West and East Pakistan. The provinces of Bengal and Punjab had only small Muslim majorities and were to be partitioned. In Punjab, this would leave the Muslims in Pakistan and Hindus and Sikhs in India. Many were frightened of being caught on the wrong side and had already left their homes. But on the night of independence, the new boundaries haven't yet been announced. I think the Mountbatten did really want a happy night. And there wasn't going to be a happy night if the boundary award had been announced. This was going to lead, in the Punjab at least, to uh, widespread disturbances. Probably nobody thought that there would be an entire, virtually 100% shift of populations between the East and the West Punjab. The night of the 14th of August had been a pitch battle in Rahore railway station with about 60 people killed. Uh, when the governor left on the early morning of the 15th by air, he looked down on a, the spoke of a flaming city. In Lahore, Muslims slaughtered non-Muslims. Across the new border, in Amritsar, Sikhs and Hindus killed all the Muslims they could find. You can't imagine what atrocities were committed. Slaughtering people, raping women, killing children. Mm -hmm. Uh, looting of properties and things like that, you see. Oh, it was the greatest bestiality you could ever imagine, on both sides. While the mobs rioted, the new nation's upper crust watched Jinnah being sworn in as Governor General. There was a flutter of excitement with him, but uh, the rest of the country was very excited. Jinnah, now installed at Government House, addressed his people. August the 15th is the birthday of the independent and sovereign state of Pakistan. At this supreme moment, my thoughts are those billion fighters in our cause who readily sacrificed all they had to make it. There was information from the Indian government that a refugee train is due to arrive. Muslim refugees from other places. And I remember twice not once, twice. When the train compartments were opened, they were full of dead bodies. They had been slaughtered. It was a horrible sight I can't get over. One million people died. One million Hindus and Muslims across the border. And ten million people were uprooted. The biggest price that any country ever paid for such kind of operation. The Pakistan that ultimately Jinnah got and the basis on which he got was based on hostility, the basis of hate. And yet for most of his political life, Jinnah had been anything but a Muslim nationalist. Indeed, unlike the Hindu Gandhi, he had little interest in religion. In 1915, 
Jinnah gave a garden party to welcome Gandhi back from South Africa. Thanking his host, Gandhi publicly singled him out as a Mohammedan. The tactless description set an uneasy tone for a relationship which would have profound consequences for the subcontinent. Jinnah resented being typecast as Muslim when his manner and dress were so westernized and modern. He was very British in his own character. That is the funny part, you see. He was so British, it's just not true. The way he behaved, the way he lived, the way he ate, the way he stood, everything that he did was very, very British. As a young man, Jinnah had trained as a lawyer in London. Back home, he soon became one of India's leading barristers and a prominent campaigner for self-rule. He was a member both of the Muslim League set up by wealthy landlords to protect Muslim interests and of the Indian National Congress, which became the leading force for Indian independence. When Gandhi came from South Africa, my father was already an established politician. What would they have had in common which would have led them to understand each other? Well, I think the original thing that was in common was how to get the British out. That was the... That was the... I mean, you know, how to get India independent. If you read what Hinad said and did right from 1906 when he really entered active politics, you cannot find a better explanation of the Hindus and Muslims coming together, emphasizing the commonality between them. Jinnah came to be known as the ambassador for Hindu-Muslim unity. But, ever the lawyer, he believed freedom should be won by political negotiation. In 1920, this provoked a split with Gandhi. Like Jinnah, Gandhi had trained in London as a barrister. But he discarded his lawyer's suit for simple peasant's clothes, and he turned the elitist independence movement into a campaign of mass civil disobedience against the British. Such unconstitutional action was to Jinnah an anathema. He was, in the very precise European sense, at that juncture, a very secular person. His politics was liberal, his politics was secular. These were the two planks he was pursuing. These were the planks on which his militant nationalism rested. And uh, Gandhi's appeal to religion as the basis of drawing people into politics, particularly as far as the communities of Islam was concerned, because he used he reached out to the pan-Islamic sentiment of the 20s, Gandhi did, and Jinnah was very unhappy about this. Isolated, Jinnah left Congress. After his final speech, rejecting Gandhi's new tactics, he was booed off the stage. His career with Congress was dashed, and so too was his personal happiness. In 1929, his young wife died. She was not yet 30. Jinnah decided to leave India. He set sail for England, where he would live for the next five years with his sister and daughter. Nothing could have seemed more improbable than that in just a few years, Jinnah would found a nation. London in the 1930s. Jinnah, in self-imposed exile, was prospering as a barrister. Meanwhile, in the unlikely setting of suburban South London, a group of Indian students came up with the revolutionary idea of a separate state for Muslims. In St. Peter, London, we had a big dinner, and we were thinking of these ideas, various ideas of how can we get freedom, how can we get freedom. And finally, it emerged like this. We will have the Muslim state, and what is the name going to be? What name? So we said the, the first name of the uh, provinces. We had P for Punjab, K for Afghania, K for Kashmir, S for Sin, and Tan for Balochistan. And we had no idea at that time of East Pakistan at, uh, uh, joining us, you see. So this is how the word Pakistan was created. The enthusiastic students took their new plan to Jinnah, now living in Hampstead with his sister Fatima and his daughter Dina. 
And when we brought this subject to him, he was absolutely furious. And he said, uh, you know, almost he said, if I can remember quoting him, had it not been for your ages, I would have taken you to be students of British imperialism. You are out to break one good the British have done, to unite the heterogeneous elements of India into a united whole. And you are out to break this. Keep away, young men. Keep away from them. Something like that. So at that time, he was still absolutely committed to an Indian union. Unity. But in the 1930s, some Muslims in India were becoming worried by Congress. They believed Gandhi, now India's political superstar, was turning it into a Hindu-dominated organization, a charge Congress and its Muslim members fervently denied. Back in London, the Serbatan students were followed by a succession of Muslim leaders pleading with Jinnah to return to India and revive the Muslim League. The League's most radical thinker was the poet, Muhammad Iqbal. He too wanted a self-governing state for Muslims. My father pointed out that if the West Minister type of democracy is introduced in the Indian subcontinent, the result of it would be that the majority would, uh, would, would keep the minority, Muslim minority, in, in its hegemony. So therefore there must be some system which should safeguard the rights of the Muslims. Separate electorate subsequently became the basis of the so-called two-nation theory and also the development of Muslim nationhood in the Indian subcontinent. And eventually you can say that it resulted in the secession of Islam from uh, India. But Jinnah wasn't ready for such ideas. When he went home to India, he still wanted to work as an ally of Congress against the British. His plans were wrecked by the elections of 1937. The Muslim League got a paltry 21% of the Muslim vote. Jinnah lost any muscle to force an accommodation with Congress. It's the day he realized that, and he injected communalism in politics. Mr. Gandhi, I say. And Mr. Jinnah resented that. And he says, you are trying to Hinduize politics. He felt the Hindu being in perpetual majority. They will wipe out the Muslims. And Muslims will remain only serfs and will be totally dominated by the Hindu majority. Gandhi's closest collaborator, the victorious Congress leader, Jawaharlal Nehru, took immediate advantage. He insisted his party alone represented the Indian people and saw no reason to share power with Jinnah. Nehru addressed the convention of Congress members and he said that there are only two powers in the land, the British and the Congress. Then Qaeda Azam said, no, there was third party and the Muslims. Zeyuddin Suleri used to go to Muslim League meetings to hear Jinnah speak. He saw how Jinnah, defeated in the election and rejected by Nehru, now embarked on a new mass strategy to whip up Muslim support. His rallying call became Islam in danger. Jinnah symbolically discarded his saddle row suit and appeared in traditional Muslim dress. He was now fomenting exactly the kind of populist religious politics which had once caused him to fall out with Gandhi. At the 1938 Muslim League conference in Patna, Jinnah accused Congress of being only a Hindu body. The speech that Mr. Jinnah made there was a bitter attack on the Congress. So bitter that Gandhi was obliged to make a reply. And I think to my mind that was the beginning, Patna was the beginning of the mass movement of the Muslim League. Popular response was tremendous, there's no question about it, because you see, he, he gave the impression that here is the saviour of Muslims from Hindu domination because of his brilliance, because of his uh, cleverness. 
because of his uh, incorruptible style of function he was uh, highly respected there's no denying that everything we do is inspired by the absolute conviction that a great evil must be removed from the world when the second world war broke out in europe london declared that india too was at war but congress was divided and Nehru and Gandhi spent much of the war in prison. The British turned to the Muslim League for support and asked Jinnah what he wanted in return. Jinnah was uncertain. He asked his political secretary for some ideas. He said, could you please give me um, a sort of brief for your, your own ideas on this? And I knew what the lines that uh, the demand for Pakistan or the idea of Pakistan was following and I prepared about, I think, it was two or three pages of notes, mainly based on that file, and I gave it to him. My father, and along with his advisor and members of the committee, spent hours with him, trying to persuade him to understand the benefit of Pakistan coming into being. And that was the arguments which went on for hours and hours at my home in Karachi. So in other words, he was persuaded by events rather than taking the initiative? Yes, he was forced by the events which took place. This is a real straightforward truth. Jinnah was being railroaded towards a destination he'd never sought. In 1940, Muslims from all over India gathered in Lahore for a momentous session of the Muslim League. Jinnah took the train from Delhi. special or something. The entire leadership being carried in one train. In the center there was a compartment in which uh, he, his sister, Ms. Fatmajina and myself. And uh, the train pulled up and the leaders, Muslim leaders would come to receive him. They were pushed by the volunteers in the crowd. Nobody knew who was where. He stood at the door and he said, look, if you don't behave, I'm going to go back. And then he shouted, discipline! And the entire lot was absolutely silent. And I'm sure a number of those people did not even know what discipline meant in the English word. Jinnah addressed the crowd at Lahore's Minto Park for nearly two hours. But the future founder of Pakistan could only speak fluently in English. My father was explaining to me what he was saying. And I did ask him, I said, he's speaking in English. And uh, would the people understand? He said, they have trust in him. So they, they, they know what he's saying. He, this old man was asked, do you know what he's saying? He's talking in English. He said, I don't know what he's saying, but I know for definite whatever he's saying is the right thing. He was uh, explaining at that time that the only answer is a separate homeland for the Muslims of India. We have tried all kinds of solutions with the communities and with the British, but unfortunately it has not come to anything. And we have come to this conclusion that now, the final solution is that there should be two states, with Muslim India and Hindu India. And uh, people understood. The Lahore session passed a resolution demanding that areas in the northeast and northwest of India, where the Muslims were a majority, should become independent states. But the resolution was deliberately vague as to whether these states should be inside or outside of federal India. partially advocated the concept of a separate Muslim state, but there were so many loopholes in it, and these loopholes indicated that there was still time if there could be any reproachment between the Hindus and the Muslims. While his followers believed he was already talking about a separate Pakistan, for Jinnah, 
It was still a bargaining counter. He was now called Kaid Azam, the great leader. By employing the imagery and symbolism of Islam, he'd found he could fire the Muslim masses. But how committed was he personally to Islam? He was not a religious man, but he wasn't irreligious either. There was no big religious thing. I asked Mr. Jinnah to say the prayers. He was a bit nervous about it because there were hundreds of thousand people looking at him all the time. We tried to explain to him that prayer is much more important to the masses because they feel that if we are talking of a religion, should come first. And that's how Mr. Dina accepted the preach. And that's how Mr. Jinnah accepted the position. I'm quite sure, basically, he was an agnostic. I, that's my gut feeling. He knew very little about Islam. I know to my, uh, personally, that uh, he never bothered about all the taboos of Islam. But uh, after he became the Qaeda -e Azam, the leader of the Muslims, I think he made uh, calculated attempts to put that under cover. Some mullahs were suspicious of Jinnah's new commitment to Islam. They opposed the Pakistan idea because they feared it would be un-Islamic and even issued fatwas against some League members. They thought Pakistan, when it is established, it will be a secular state like Turkey. Because all those who are supporting this movement for Pakistan, their approach, according to them, was not really purely Islamic. It was the westernized version of Islam. In other words, that Islam was safer within an undivided yes. India than it was within a Muslim state. Yes, exactly. This is what their impression was, and that's why they opposed the Pakistan movement. The Pakistan idea was spreading into the markets and mosques of Muslim India. Some young enthusiasts distributed news sheets to convince the Muslims that they were being done down by the Hindus. चीजें कर्ज पे देते थे फिर जिस दिन उनका फसल उठता था उस फसल में वो पैसा देते फिर उस पर सूद भी लेते थे चुनाचे बहुत सी जमीनें मुसलमानों का जो है हिंदुओं ने उस कर्ज के बदले में रख लिया था तो यहां के लोगों को जो है हिंदुओं के इस अमल के खिलाफ बहुत नफरत थी बहुत शिकायत थी वाज योर न्यूज़पेपर प्रोपेगेंडा यस यस इन 1942 with the fall of Singapore and Rangoon, the war reached India's doorstep. The British government, desperate for India's help, sent Cabinet Minister Sir Stafford Cripps to win over Congress and the Muslim League. And we hope that the Indian leaders will give the help they have already promised us as regards the mobilization of that great people in the protection of their own country. In exchange for Jinnah's cooperation, Cripps conceded that any province could opt out of a future independent India. But Jinnah, now raising the stakes, rejected the offer on the grounds that Pakistan was not explicitly named. Jinnah was talking tough, but his purpose was still unclear. Did he want his Pakistan to stay within India or to become a new separate state? The house where Jinnah once lived in Bombay, long abandoned, now falling into decay. In September 1944, in grander days, it was the scene of lengthy negotiations between Jinnah and Gandhi, his old adversary, who had recently been released from detention. The Mahatma journeyed to Jinnah, still hoping to persuade him back into the All India fold. I think like two 
the stalwarts doing a case, each recognized the merit of the other and was trying to find a weakness in the point of view of the other. I think Gandhi realized that he was up against a sort of rock, as it were, who wasn't going to budge. And uh, uh, Jinnah realized he was up against a very clever fellow, which he was. It was all to do with human vanity, you know. But Gandhi wanted to be the man who uh, uh, had an amazing struggle with the British and by his perseverance and non-violence and lying in the roads and so on, he made the British go. All rubbish, of course, but... Uh, <laughs> and uh, Jinnah kept on sort of spoiling that by, by wanting uh, to have a divided India and all this. And both were a match for each other. Now, for example, the famous incident where in the, in the very first day Mr. Gandhi said, you have mesmerized the Muslims. Mr. Jinnah retorted, you have hypnotized the Hindus. But the talks got nowhere. The two men stuck to their old positions. Gandhi refused to accept that India contained two nations of Hindus and Muslims. Jinnah insisted on their separateness. Mr. Jinnah claimed that he will only represent the Muslims. And Mr. Gandhi said he's representing the whole of India. And Mr. Jinnah cornered him and says, no, you cannot, you can at the most say that you are representing the Congress. And Congress in turn represents predominantly the Hindus. There was another stumbling block in our way. Now, we couldn't uh, uh, say that Congress is a Hindu organization. It was impossible for us to say it because we were not a Hindu organization. Congress was a nationalist organization comprising of all nationalities and of all communities. So if I participated in the struggle for freedom, it is as an Indian, not exactly as a Muslim. The talks may have failed, but Jinnah's prestige was heightened simply by the Mahatma's public recognition of him. Jinnah's secretary, Sharifuddin Pirzada, was present throughout. Mr. Jinnah's point was that he will make his best efforts to convince Mr. Gandhi about the possibility of establishment of Pakistan. At least he should accept the principle. Then the details can be worked out subsequently. So Mr. Jinnah was able to project Pakistan in this way. And these talks more or less receive international notice. For Gandhi, the talks were a disaster. For Jinnah, they were an inspiration. He was now touring India, building the Muslim League as a mass movement. Whenever he visited the Punjabi capital, Lahore, he would stay among the students of Islamia College. Ishlal Zaidi was one. Once I remember, somebody from us asked a rather naive question. He said, uh, Kai, everybody is saying that Mr. Gandhi travels by a third class train, but you travel by first class and you live in this huge houses and he lives very simply and he became thoughtful. But he said, uh, look, the two things, one is a leader should show himself what he is and the people must accept him what he is. I do not live in double life. Uh, there has to be a transparency. With Gandhi and Jinnah at loggerheads, the Viceroy, Lord Wavell, who believed independence was now inevitable, called a conference at the Hill Resort of Simla to discuss membership of the transitional government. Jinnah insisted that all Muslims in any such government had to be members of his Muslim League, cutting out Muslims who belonged to Congress and other parties. The talks collapsed. The political significance of it was that he wanted that whatever constitutional arrangement that Britain arrives at, it has to be, it has to have his approval and he would not give the approval unless he was recognized on the same level, on par with, with Gandhi. That was the whole trouble with it. That is why he ridiculed the Congress Muslims like me. He, he ridiculed all those people who disagreed with him. Gandhi was not half as dictatorial as Jinnah was. Gandhi believed in carrying people with him. Jinnah sort of dictated. At last, Labour is in power in Britain, and here are some members of the new government. 
Prime Minister and Sir Stafford Cripps. The new Labour government in London promised independence for India. It decided to call elections, the first since 1937, to assess the strengths of Congress and the Muslim League. Then we decided to go to the villages and small towns and gave them the message of Muslim League, that why did we want a separate homeland for the Muslims? The impact was electric, absolutely. League support was growing all the time, but Congress was blind to it. Its leaders, like Nehru, had spent the last three years of the war in prison and completely underestimated Jinnah's mass appeal. Nehru got frightfully angry, and I can see, see him now standing by his fireplace, and he started yelling at me, and he almost hit me. He said, no, you're absolutely wrong. They're just a myth. They're, no, they're nothing at all. They're just the imagination of the British. I said, I think you'll find they're not. And I talked to him for four hours, and at the end he calmed down. He said, well, maybe we will have to do something about the Muslim League. So he was just beginning to see the light. But, you see, he'd been away in jail so often, and he hadn't realized the enormous pressures that had been building up resentment against the high-handed methods of, the co of Congress. The League won almost 90% of the Muslim vote in the elections. It was now clearly the authentic voice of Muslim nationalism. Its victory sharpened religious differences throughout North India. With the rising tension, the British government wanted to get out of India as soon as possible. Cripps returned with two other cabinet ministers to negotiate with the Indian leaders. It was known, and Wave had reported it back to London, but I'd got on very well with Jinnah and the Muslim League. And so uh, my specific role began as being the liaison with Jinnah, uh, because Cripps couldn't bear to be in the same room as him. Jinnah now showed, even at this late stage, that he was still far from committed to a total breakaway. On the 16th of May, 1946, the mission published its plan. It proposed a system of government which would reassure Muslims by grouping the Muslim provinces into units with a large measure of autonomy, but still remaining inside a united India. It was the last chance of avoiding partition. Everything now depended on Jinnah. Would he agree to such a plan when it meant going back on the Pakistan demand? This is, I think, one of the amazing things in history. Till May 1946, for the last six years, everybody was talking about a separate homeland and Pakistan. And then Qaeda Azam, uh, in his wisdom, thought that, well, uh, we can give another trial to uh, a cabinet mission scheme because it was for a period of ten years and we'll see how it works, which man means temporarily going back on Pakistan. There was going to be a center. And when he announced, there was not one person who opposed this. said, well, because Qaeda Azam has said it, so it must be the right thing to do. I was the president then of the Muslim League in Sindh. We accepted that situation and said that if there are the safeguards, we would uh, give up the idea of Pakistan and wait. If the safeguards which Mr. Jinnah had put forward were accepted, I think the masses would have accepted it. But the British offer was torpedoed, not by Jinnah, but by Congress's President Nehru, who rejected outright the scheme for the grouping of Muslim provinces. After uh, Nehru's press conference in 1946, when he became the Congress president, replacing Azad, and he said, we will go in the Constituent Assembly unfettered. We will do what we want. And then Gina said, I can never trust these people. Even when they agree, they go back. And Sardar Patel described that on the part of Nehru as an act of emotional insanity. That was the most tragic moment in India's history. Jinnah was finally pushed over the edge. It was the defining moment. He demanded a sovereign state of Pakistan and called a Muslim League Day of Action. In unleashing the power of the masses, he was for the first time turning his back on constitutional methods as well as a united India. In Calcutta, 5,000 people were killed.
and I saw for the and I saw for the first time what riot does to people. I saw a man, you know, with his throat cut. There was just this awful feeling of doom or, or of great disaster because people were being killed, which one had not thought would happen, and that was 1946. And that changed the whole, whole, of, the, uh, whole of the complexion of the, uh, the thing completely. In the Hindu-Muslim fasad, 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 the Galta alta che musulmanan kam di daghi aghi pas zargun urbane zargun musulmanan aghi crash kar. He didn't like emotionalism. He didn't encourage emotionalism. That's why I don't think he'll encourage rioting, because he did want, he did make a mob into a nation. He wanted to make a mob into a nation. He did succeed three quarters of it, but the mob sort of reverted and became a mob. And I think that was a matter of great sorrow to him. Jinnah's concept of Pakistan included an undivided Punjab and Bengal, but Muslims there were only a small majority. He now had to get the best he could in the empire endgame. In February 1947, Prime Minister Attlee announced the British would leave India by June the following year. With the end of British rule in sight, the Muslim League in Punjab stepped up its civil disobedience campaign. Sikhs and Hindus fought back. And the violence was then started about March 1947. So it was really the entire Muslim population. Every day they would just come out on the streets, were beaten up, they were tear gassing. But the government realized that every day the gathering and the numbers were bigger than before. Starting from Lahore, they went to the other places like Amritsar, to Rawalpindi, to Jalandhar, all the other towns. There was a danger of a complete collapse of the, of the central authority. This, is, this was the danger of the situation. And, I, and the, 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 the talk about there having been a scuttle and a rush at the end is simply the reverse of the truth. The truth is that it had gone on far too long. The whole, the whole discussion, the transfer of power had been under discussion with the same leaders for nearly five years. In March 1947, the last Viceroy, Lord Louis Mountbatten, descended on India. The British and Congress had grudgingly accepted that India would have to be divided. I think under the terms of reference that Mountbatten had, partition was inevitable. We were officially required to try and revive the Cabinet Mission Plan. But the Cabinet Mission Plan was a, was a plan that involved a weak central government. And a weak central government was not going to be able to govern. If Jinnah was to have his Pakistan, Mountbatten, whose sympathies lay with Nehru, was determined it should be as small as possible. Only those districts of Bengal and Punjab, where the Muslims were in a majority, would be included. Mountbatten feared that Jinnah would reject his plan for a truncated Pakistan. But time was not on Jinnah's side. Now 70, he wanted to be head of the new state. One evening after the talks, Mountbatten's chief of staff, Lord Ismay, reported that Jinnah seemed ready to take whatever he could get. But towards the end of the dinner, someone asked the question, how did the talks go? And Ismay, getting hold of a cigarette, uh, 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 a matchbox, which lay on the table for lighting cigars, and saying, today I had the impression that if I wrote Pakistan, on this matchbox, Mr. Jinnah would accept it. The point of fact, the actual decision to accept the plan was made on his behalf by Mountbatten. And all he did was to nod his head, which is all he had to do. He didn't nod his head the wrong way, he nodded it in, in uh, a nodding of acceptance. And that was, that was, in fact, the actual token agreement which 
which made possible the June the 3rd plan to be announced and the Government of India Act to be passed and all the rest of the transaction. We must remember that we have to take momentous decisions and handle grave issues facing us in the solution of the complex political problem of this great subcontinent inhabited by 400 million people. I was in London, my house, and he phoned, and he said, we've got it. I said, got it, you know, what, what, and he said, Pakistan. I said, well, you've worked hard for it. And we had a personal conversation, and that was it. Two months later, Jinnah was Pakistan's first head of state. He was an exhausted man. The reception died out, Mr. Jinnah. And uh, he gradually moved from the crowd in the lawn onto the terrace and uh, said to one of us, uh, tell Mountbatten I'm tired and I'd like to leave. And so uh, Mountbatten came and uh, he said something about, uh, you know, he will uh, get used to these occasions and so on. But he didn't make an allowance for the fact none of us knew that he was ill. Flags at half-mast express the mourning of Karachi, the city where Jinnah was born and capital of the state he brought into being. A year later, Jinnah was dead. At his swearing-in, he'd already been suffering from the lung cancer which would kill him. Shortly before partition, he'd given a speech setting out what sort of state he'd really wanted to create. You may belong to any religion or caste or creed that has nothing to do with the business of the state. You will find that in course of time, Hindus would cease to be Hindus and Muslims would cease to be Muslims. Not in the religious sense, because that is the personal faith of each individual, but in the political sense, as citizens of the state. That shows that he never believed in the two-nation theory. That shows that, really speaking, he made use of Islam just in order to get what he wanted. And he did not even get what he wanted because what he got was truncated, not heathen Pakistan, as he said. The one thing I know, and I, I was very much aware of, and, and he discussed it, he never really wanted to, uh, to break away. You know, he, he thought India could, we, everybody could live together and come to terms with, with the, the Congress party or the Hindu government or what, whoever was going to be in charge. And uh, as history tells us, it wasn't to be. Whatever Jinnah really wanted, Pakistan was what he got. And millions of Pakistanis are glad that he got it. Today, more than ever, he is the nation's figurehead. But some who knew and loved Jinnah doubt whether the country now reflects its founder's vision. I was very proud of Pakistan. I had great expectations of Pakistan. And what I had suffered in India had made me even more pro-Pakistan. He always discussed that he intended to make this country a secular state. The way it had been distorted and corrupted, I could not have imagined. If Mr. Jinnah came back to Pakistan today, what do you think he'd think? He will, his dream would have been, will be shattered. He would be surprised, he would be flabbergasted, and I think <coughs> people who are in charge of fair will say, go back to your place. The moment